Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have our returning guest, Valeska Paris. Valeska, welcome to the show. Thank you. Valeska, our first interview was fascinating material we covered. And today we want to talk about your childhood growing up inside the Church of Scientology. Now, one thing I noticed, Valeska, is you were born in Geneva, Switzerland. Yes. How were you born in Geneva? What were your parents doing there? Well, my mom is from Switzerland and my dad is from France. And so, yeah, my mom lived in Switzerland. That's how I was born there. Okay, so that explains it. Now, a question I have, by the time you're six years old, you're in the Scientology Cadet Org. Yes. In, in Stonelands in the United Kingdom. Yeah, in uh, September 84, I got there. Well, how does your family come from Geneva, Switzerland, over to the UK? Were your, were your parents in the church when you were born? Yes, my parents were both in Scientology when I was born. Yeah, were, um, they, were they Sea Org members or publics? They were public, and they had planned on joining the Sea Org, but they never went, and then they got divorced. My um, mum had an affair with Albert, who was a Scientologist sent to help with their marriage and then they ended up having an affair and she left my dad to go with him. Wow, so much for Scientology marriage counseling. Uh, yeah, exceptional. Uh, well, no. so did your mother, uh, after your, your parents were split up, I'm sorry that happened, you were young, did your, did your mother join the Sea Org then? No, my mom went with stayed with Albert in Switzerland at first and my dad went to the Sea Org in England. So is that what did your father take you then with him? Yes, that was like one of the conditions for the divorce that he would get custody of all three kids and we would go to the Sea Org. Oh no, that's interesting. So they're they're seeing you as future Sea Org members and so they want the kids. Yes. Because one thing about Scientology people should realize they play for keeps. Money, yes. money, children, people's lives, their cars, their inheritance, anything they can get from you. So suddenly you're you're plucked you're plucked up and you're relocated to this is it called Stonelands? Yes, right Stonelands. Now now describe the actual buildings. I've seen pictures of it and I'll post a picture in the show notes. Okay, so when we were living there it was like this really old um building made of stones and it was super super run down because they didn't have the money to renovate it it was um three levels high um it was always cold because like most of the windows was were broken there was no real heating um and it was completely like it felt really haunted it used to be a graveyard Oh, I could. See, yeah, I'm looking at a picture, and it does look. It does look haunted. So you're there with your brother and your sister. Yeah, my sister was four. My brother was two. So you were the oldest. I was, and I, I am mean, the oldest. Yes. And but I mean, you're six years old, and I mean, you're you've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. So you felt. Yeah. Did, you, did you feel very responsible for them? Um. Well, to some degree, yeah, I felt like. Um, well, I also felt responsible for my dad because he was a complete mess because he still loved my mum and he didn't want to divorce her and he would come home for family time and be like in complete distress the whole time and like the only reason I'm still alive is because I have you free and so I felt like even though there was no choice for me but I didn't know that there was no choice for me but to be there but I felt like guilted into staying with him like I felt I had to stay with him because if we went with my mom then he would be all alone sure and I, yeah and as a child you you often feel to blame for things that are happening with your parents yeah e even though you're not you some children take that, that I'm to blame and I have to keep things together now do you really understand Scientology at all or, or what your father's doing when you're six what do you think it is no, look, I, at that time, I had no interest in Scientology. As I said before, I believed in God because of my grandma, but I knew that I shouldn't believe in God. Like, I knew 
that it had to be Scientology and nothing else. So it was like my secret between me and my grandma. Mm. And yeah, and we got there and we just got dumped in the cadet org. We didn't speak any English at all. There was a, like tons of other kids there. Um, they would come up to us and like make fun of us and tease us. Wait, and my dad you, just left. Was your native language French? Yes. So you're, yeah, speak, we have, you're speaking French in largely English-speaking boarding home. Well, we we were the, the actually one of our nannies, Dominique, was French, but other than that, we were like the only French kids there. And then uh, later on, Amandine and Olivier arrived, and then a family of five girls, kids arrived. Well, what was the daily schedule like for children? At Stonelands. So when we first got there, um, we would we were put to work basically. So we would have to go and clean the house, clean the toilets. We would use bleach. We didn't have protection. Um, me and Melissa and Raphael went to Greenfield School because my stepdad paid for it. So it was like a study tech school, but really a Scientology school. So we would get up at like seven. We'd go to school, we'd get back, and we'd be put to work. And then we'd have to go and study L. Ron Hubbard check sheets for like an hour. What a dreary, uh, dreary life for children. What, now, what happened on weekends? Did you, did you get to spend time with your father on the weekends or sometime during the day? No. On the weekend, we worked all weekend. Um, if we were up that we were entitled to have like a day off every other Saturday. Um, but my dad rarely took time off anyway. So but not you as children, you wouldn't have any money. Would, would your stepfather or your father give you any money for, for the things you needed? No, we in, I know in some other cadet orgs, they got paid like hardly anything, but in our cadet org, we never got paid. Um, and my father actually rarely got paid. Like it was really, a dirt, dirt poor existence. Well, what, what did you do for, you know, clothing, soap, shampoo, food? I mean, how, what were the living conditions? So we lived in dormitories. We didn't live with our parents. We, I mean, my mum wasn't there anyways, but we didn't live with my dad. We lived in dormitories that were um, disgusting. Um, the, the place smelled like pee and it was dirty and run down. The food was disgusting as well. We had a, a cook that didn't know how to cook, and there was such a small amount of money spent on food anyways that the food was almost inedible at times. Um, we never brushed our teeth. I don't remember ever brushing my teeth. Um, I don't, like, no one made us shower, so we, did, we showered when we wanted to. So there's no um, base, no, there's not any basic hygiene taught to you as children. No, uh, when I first got there, like the the showers was like this big um, um, room, and it wasn't proper showers. It was just like one stream of water coming down, and there was um, six showers all next to each other, no curtains, um, concrete floor. It was painted red, and there was always cat cat shit all over the floor so yeah when I first got there they made all the cadets shower together and actually that was my first experience of doing OWs in lower conditions because I was like six and they wanted me to shower with the boys and I was like I'm not showering with boys so I ran away <laughs> I ran away down the hallway um and then the nanny chased me down, and I was put in a room, and I had to write my OWs. Now, what are OWs? We have a lot of, a lot of people who aren't conversant with the language of Scientology. So that's overt and withhold. So it's like things that you have – overt is things that you have done that are considered bad. And then withhold means you haven't told anyone about it. So it would be like – and at that time, you'd have to write like time, place, form – event so I'd have to write like 8 30 a.m. Um, place stolen's event I stole an apple and then 
um, I mean, form, I store an app on an event, you'd have to write down like exactly what you did. This just makes no sense at all. Uh, you, I, I mean, I'm thinking of this when if I were six years old, I wouldn't even know how to process this experience. You know, and by way of contrast, you know, when I was six, I had to go maybe for a week to this uh, Bible camp, you know, a church Bible camp. Mm-hmm. And it was up in the mountains, and it, and it, again, it was kind of a grungy, rundown place where they dump a bunch of kids into really substandard living conditions. And yeah. I remember, I remember getting there, and and there were no parents. There were some adults, you know, but there were no parents, and there were bunks, and it was really freezing and disorienting. And I was afraid. Yeah, I was just really afraid, and and the food was awful, and you you it was so unfamiliar. And I didn't know how to process it. And they were talking about Jesus and God and hell. And and I knew that I would be out in a week. And that was like my really my only salvation. I knew that I only had to stay there for a week. And I remember suffering the whole time. Yeah, awful. well. It was just awful. But you, 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 there was no end in sight for you and your brother and sister. No, and my brother, like he was two years old. So he was only just learning to speak. And he was dumped in a nursery. There was like one nanny to look after. There was, I don't know, about 20 babies at that time because they were still having babies in the Sea Org. Um, the, like people like me would go and help change the nappies and stuff. And they would just be like lying in cots, crying or, you know, sitting on the floor uh, screaming. And there, would, there was like hardly any supervision. So that's where my brother went. He wasn't put to work. Obviously, he was two. Um, and he didn't speak till he was four years old. He just stopped speaking because mm. he was so confused. It was from French and then it was to English. So we would actually like me and my sister, when my dad came home, like if some, if we had stolen something, we would just <laughs> blame it on him. Mm. But yeah. But I mean, you mean your, your children. Did you feel you were, a, you had been abandoned by your parents? I was like I when I first got there I was so confused, upset. I was I would purposely hurt myself to try and get attention. Yes. Until yeah, like I would fall over and hurt myself and cry so that I could get some sort of affection, but that didn't go very far cuz I just got yelled at for for being like PTS and and for hurting myself. So I stopped that. I would have like dreams of like how could I hurt myself bad enough so that my mum would have to come and because mm. we didn't know where our mum was like it was so confusing we just went to this place went from living like in a, a normal house with a mum and a dad to just being dumped in this place hardly ever seeing my dad not knowing where my mum was and having these nannies that hated us and would yell at us and make us work and like nothing you did was right like one time I had to wipe the tables after we ate and I put the crumbs in my hands and then threw them in the garbage and I got yelled at for not putting them on the floor because I had to sweep the floor anyway so yeah you couldn't do anything right no being a cadet coordinator like being in charge of the cadet org was a degrading job to have It, it was where you went if you had really messed up and that, that's what's happened to you? No, I mean, like, the cadet, the person that uh, looked after the kids would be sent there if they had messed up really badly. Like, it was a punishment to go look after the children, the Sea Org children. Oh, I see. So that, that was the last job that any Sea Org member wanted. That's right. So anyone that we had as a nanny was, was bitter. Yeah, so they hated life, hated being there. It was like a demotion. Yeah, it was a degrading job to have. You know, this is very interesting, Valeska, because, you know, outside of Scientology, children are viewed as the future. They're the most valuable. You know, we love our children. We cherish them. We do everything we can for them. Here where I live in the state of California, you have to be trained, certified, compassionate. You go through first aid courses. You have psychological courses. You know how to handle children, how to be responsible and take care of them. And it's a job you want to have. You know, people that can teach kindergarten, that can teach young children preschool, it's a gift and a a talent. And it's something they want to do. But in in Scientology, children are are throwaway 
let's throw them away and warehouse them here until they can become working Sea Org members. Well, that's only Sea Org children. Like sure. Scientology children will have like a normal home and they'll go to Scientology school and that's not as bad. But if you're a Sea Org child and your your parents are in a Sea Org, then you're just basically dumped with all the other children and um, in a place which is completely understaffed um, with people that are completely not qualified. Like one of the nannies we had was just looking after the babies, like newborn babies to about two-year-olds. And he he was in this little yellow, um, we called it the yellow brick house, and it was like a house next to Stoneland's. And he wouldn't let any of us go help with the kids, with the babies. And it was found out that he was actually teaching these two-year-olds how to have sex and making them lie on top of each other and play with with his private yeah. parts. Why weren't the police called? Because that's not what you do in the seal. It's it's you don't. It's against our Ron Hubbard policy to involve the authorities. So he was just kicked out of the seal. That was his punishment. So there's no protection from from pedophiles. No, no. And we had another guy. He was a peeping tom, and he would look in on the grown women Sea Org members while they showered and they were like okay well we'll send him to the RPF and then they decided well actually we'll give him one more chance so we'll make him the in charge of the cadet org so he came and looked after us oh that's bizarre so they they take a a, a sexual predator and put him in charge of children yes and that's lo and behold he set up cameras in the girls dorms and would get off on watching us change and, and then was he kicked out of the church? He, he did it for years. Like he was, I went to flag and he got kicked out after I left. And yeah, he just got kicked out. His wife was also like, she was the main nanny. And when he first came to the cadet org, he like took me under his wing as like his favorite little pet. Mm -hmm. And he put me in a room and had me like write my OWs. And he was just like sitting there with me. And then he made me the MAA, so I was like in charge of making sure the other cadets um, did what they were supposed to do. And his wife hated me, like she hated me. And I didn't understand why then, but now I do, because he was like a sexual predator and a pervert. So shocking to outsiders to hear how criminal Scientology could be on the inside. Yeah, but yeah, what happened to him is he got kicked out, and that's it. And now he is happily living in France, and his wife left with him. And there was no penalty; nothing no, happened. No, no, no. He, so, uh, he just wa he walked away scot free. Now, how long did you you live in Stonelands before you left? So I was in the cadet org from the age of six to fourteen, and then I went to the U.S. to visit my mum, who was in the Sea Org at Flag, and I joined the Sea Org at Flag <laughs> at fourteen. So that was your way to escape from yeah, the cadet org? Yeah, escape into the Sea Org. So it, was, <laughs> it wasn't much of an escape, but I couldn't go back there because Dominique was, because Jeremy was our nanny at the time, and she was also one of the nannies, and she was like, she put me in lower conditions. Like a bunch of us were put in lower conditions because we became super rebellious. And she let everyone out of the lower conditions except for me. So I was literally in lower conditions for like six months. For our non-Scientology, people who've never been in the church, what is a lower condition and what do you have to do when you're in a lower condition? So the lower conditions are from um, confusion and then the, the one that's like the, before you get out is liability. So in liability, you basically have to make up the damage so you have to do extra work um you can't have any rewards like you can't watch movies you can't you basically have to do tons and tons of extra work and then you have to get everybody to sign okay to you being back in the group it's just a form of punishment for if you've if you've said the wrong thing done the wrong thing well how did your how did your brother and sister make it out of stonelands what were their stories? So Melissa, um, when I went, when I joined the Seal Get Flag, um, Melissa went. To see, like I lost track of them. I was so by that time I was so dedicated that I didn't even 
care about my family. But, um, yeah, I know she lived with Phil and Willie Jones in Florida because she was basically homeless, and they took her in. And Raphael stayed in the cadet org, and then he ended up going because my dad left the Sea Org, and Raphael went and lived with him in Chicago. And I know that he joined staff in Chicago. He never joined the Sea Org. I see. And uh, Phil and Willie Jones are, are dear friends of Karen and I. They stay here at the house when they're in town. We just we just love them dearly. Yeah. You're now 14. You're a Sea Org member. Yes. Yeah. So th- is it? Do you look at this as a big change, as a new phase of life for you? What do you hope to get out of being in the Sea Org? Is it just like escape? I had from- nowhere else to go. I had nowhere yeah. else to go. Like the the Cadet Org was was hell and. It was an escape, but it wasn't really an escape because I was just in the Sea Org at Flag now. I was near my mum, which was one good thing because I was, like, I really loved my mum. But, it like, that the our birthing was f- full of cockroaches. It was disgusting. So it wasn't much of an upgrade from Stolen's. But when you're 14 and you can't make a living, you have nowhere to live, nothing to eat. I mean, that's the only place you were thrown to your own devices. It was the Sea Org of the Streets. Yes, and what actually happened, one of the things that happened is that uh, when I was 13, my stepdad, um, that's when he lost all of his fortune, so he couldn't pay for us to go to Greenfields anymore. So me and Melissa were sent to Inverhorn School, which was like the the public school, which you could say that that would be better, but because of the fact that we were Sea Org children, we had no hope at that school. Like, literally, when we went on the bus, um, we had this broken down blue bus that the Sea Org kids rode on. We would hide under the seats because there would be people throwing rocks at the bus. Really? Yes, and anyone from the Cadet Org who went to that school would lie. Like, we would not ever tell anyone we were Scientologists, that we were SEAL kids. So we would have to, like, pretend that we lived somewhere we didn't live. And they knew that I was. Like, it was kind of obvious. So, like, I was just there with no friends at all, and I didn't want to be there. So I would, in the morning, I'd get on the bus, and then when no one was looking, I'd jump off the bus and just stay at Stonelands all day. So you were bullied at the other school for being different? Yeah, because we were Scientologists. We'd be called brainwashers. Like, they would yell at us, brainwashers. And even at Greenfields, like, we were different because we were always the kids that had dirty uniforms and that, you know, had head lice. Like, there'd be head lice checks every Monday because of the cadets because we would always have head lice, so... We'd always be the kids that got sent home with head lice. Uh, deplor- deplorable living conditions, and the church is not stepping in to say, let's improve conditions here. At And, and you know, this is Tom Cruise goes on in his leaked Go to Guns video. Scientologists, we can improve conditions. But yet what you're saying, they improve nothing, exactly nothing. In fact, they make it worse for children. No, they destroy families. They, they destroyed my family. And... I, you know, we in the cadet org, we got to a point, like, they canceled family time. So I got to a point where, like, I didn't, I'd rather have spent time with the other cadets than my own father, you know? Yes, yeah, so you developed your own group. Yes, and we got Oof. to a point where we were really rebellious. Like, we, because, like, at the Int Ranch, there was a lot more control, and they had, like, it was horrible. The Int Ranch was horrible. But there was a lot more, like, they had more nannies, they had nicer birthing, they had proper food. But we lived in a place where we had to steal our food. Like, we had a whole uh, way set up on how to steal food. So, I was... how, how, How would you steal food? Okay, so I was super skinny. So, my job, and the windows were all broken. So, my job was to put my hand through the window open the window, climb through the window into the kitchen, climb over the sink, go down another window, climb up like a brick wall, which had like little steps in it, 
then squeeze through this window and then get in the pantry and steal like uh, oats, powdered milk, hot chocolate powder, whatever I could get. My sister's job was usually, and I think she had a couple others with her, but her job was to knock on the the um, galley door. Then John, our cook, would open the door and she'd spray his face with water and he would chase her. So she had to run away and get him to chase her for long enough and not catch her for us to get, it was usually me and Emily to get into the pantry and steal the food. Was that Emily Jones? No, no, Emily Ben Ryan. Different Emily. So you should create a distraction. But but stealing food, this simply means you were malnourished. We were starving. Like the food that we had was, the Sea Org at, St. Hill got shit food, but they got better food than we did in the cadet org. So you're you're chronically undernourished. Mm-hmm. When I went to school every morning, I would check every locker to see if anyone had left food, and if they had, I would steal it and eat it. For sure, if you were if you were starving, Leah Remini once told me that when she was young and in the Sea Org, starving, she actually went to a toaster and you know opened the bottom of it to get the crumbs to eat. Yeah. Because she was starving. And I would eat off the floor. Like if I saw like food on the floor, I would. I know it's disgusting, but when you're starving, if you see food, you eat it. So I would pick up food like on the ground and eat it. And there's nobody to report this to. I mean, you don't have any adults you can say, hey, we're starving. No, they don't care. Like we were just a distraction. There was one time when I was um, 12, around 12 years old, where... Um, we tried to break into the galley and it, it went south. I had a mop in my hands and the cook, John, went after me. So I tried to hit him with the mop and he took it out of my hands and he was like whacking me in the face with the end of the mop, which was like so disgusting and stinky and black and it was painful, obviously. So then one of the cadets gave me a, a broom and we were having like a sword fight. But obviously he was a lot stronger than me. So... I tried to call child abuse, so I went, we had a phone at Stolen's. I remember the phone numbers, 810205. Anyway, so I called child abuse, and I tried to get through, and then it was reported, so they ripped the phone off the wall. Really? Mm-hmm. So they, they ripped the phone off the wall? So we couldn't call child abuse. Just outright criminality. I mean, you're going to silence children that are malnourished, hungry, not being properly educated or cared for. Now, you mentioned in our earlier interview there was no toilet paper at Stonelands. No, we never had toilet paper, ever. Oh. So if you want to hear the disgusting truth of what happened, um, there was like a big book case at, at Stonelands on the second floor, and there was books there. So some kids would go and like just rip pages out of the books. Sure. And some kids would use their hands and wipe it on the wall. Oh, that's disgusting. But look, it's disgusting, but that's how it was. Of course, that's how it was, because you 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 have to take care of these things. And this is real life. And I this is something I never apologized for on any of my podcasts. This is actually documentary. I lived through it. This is a hellish nightmare. Yeah. And And those are, like, the thing that I really, that's really passionate to me is the people that were children that were dumped in the Sea Org, they are, like, that was the real tragedy. Like, we didn't have a choice. And when people keep talking about Tom Cruise and John Travolta, I'm like, they're not the face of Scientology, you know? Well, no, not at all, because you've just, and I'm a parent, okay? You provide for your children. You teach them how to brush their teeth. You teach them personal hygiene, how to bathe, wash your hair, clip your fingernails. You know, these are these are things you have to teach your children. But for, this is what galls me, Valeska, a very wealthy church. And this is something new Scientology watchers have to understand, how money works in the church. Mm-hmm. Scientology has all the money in the world to pander and cater to Tom Cruise, yes, John Travolta, Kelly Preston, Ann Archer, mm-hmm. and you just go down the list of celebrities. They have all the money in the world to wait on these people hand and foot 
the finest food, the finest luxuries, a celebrity center. But there's no money for toilet paper or toothbrushes for children. No, like when we did shower, which by the end it was like, because we also, the girls' dorm was put up in a nursery. So it was just like this old nursery and we just like lived there. And um, we would have to go outside. Now, in uh, Cadet Org, no one wore shoes. Like, we never wore shoes. Even in the winter? Uh, never. Never. Like, we would have to run down to the shower, and we'd have to run through the snow. So it was, like, it was really cold to do it. And we would get go in the shower and wait till the hot water ran out, because it would always run out. But we never had, like, we never had soap or anything. It was just under the water. I remember the first time that I got shampoo was when I was like 13 and I remember it was we the cadets got like this peach shampoo and we thought it was so cool because it was scented and we weren't supposed to use scented but we did. Wow and just on a side note L. Ron Hubbard had an aversion to, to, to scented things. Yeah. As, as he due to his heavy chain smoking three packs of cools a day he, he began, everything began to smell like rose perfume to him as he got older. And Jesse Prince, you know, tells the story, I've interviewed him. Uh, Ron would smell rose perfume and everything and became convinced that the psychs, the psychiatrists were somehow putting rose perfume in everything and perhaps it had psych drugs in it to, to you know, to control people or enslave them. That's so pretty psychotic. This, well, Ron put a ban on anything that was scented. Yes, yeah. And, and that was because he was a chain smoker and he and, and obviously screwed up his sinuses, you know, and in his sense of smell and taste even. Yeah. So because he can't control his personal habits because he has to chain smoke, all scents have been banned in the church. Yeah. And this goes down to a ridiculous level. Let me just hobby horse on this for a minute. Bless you, indulge me. In in auditing uh, session, you use hand cream before the beginning of the session. Yeah. You put you. Now, Ron ordered that it had to be unscented hand cream. And there was a brand called Standard Hand Cream, if you remember that, right? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, unscented, and it gave you maximum conduction for the hand-to-can interface. Yeah. And, and this is the ridiculousness of Scientology. So Ron, is, Ron Hubbard is wanting to eradicate all scents. Yeah. In the church. But he doesn't care if the children don't have proper hygiene or toilet paper. Yeah. And we, like, sometimes, like, my stepmom, she tried her hardest with us. Like, I'm actually really glad my dad married her because she really tried. And, you know, sometimes she'd get us, like, simple. It was always simple. That was the brand. And it was, like, so crap and didn't really, like, it didn't, it doesn't work very well. The one we had. No, no, wouldn't. You know, I grew up in a, a lower middle class home. We were fairly poor, not a lot of money. We always had the necessities. Yeah. We didn't have any luxuries by any means. I mean, the home I grew up in, the, the carpet had worn through several places where you'd see the concrete floor. And there yeah. was a lot of times we, we, we didn't we didn't have very much at all, but we had the necessities. Yeah, like with us, honestly, like we didn't, the clothes that we got were always from like Oxfam or Bernardo's. And um, like I was lucky because we were lucky because my grandma from Switzerland would send us like underwear. But I would share my underwear with the other cadets. Well, you were living communally, right? Yeah, and some of them didn't have underwear. Like, they didn't have a grandma to send them anything. And so they would share, like, mine or my sister's because we got them from my grandma. Sorry, what, what you're describing, Valeska, is abject poverty. It was, yeah, it was, yeah. Arnie Lerma tells a story, and uh, Lermanet.com, fabulous site. Arnie was in the Sea Org, Arnie Lerma. Fa fabulous former member, or fabulous former Sea Org member, great critic. He tells a story. He worked at a relay station, the Sea Org in New York. And he used to be, and L. Ron Hubbard would send out lists from the ship of what he wanted. So Arnie would pack T-bone steaks on dry ice to ship to L. Ron Hubbard on the ship. Oh, well, lucky him. <laughs> 
Well, no, look, look, look yeah. at it. So, so L. Ron Harvard was oblivious to the human suffering of children and those around him, but he made sure that he got air freighted to him, T-bone steaks on dry ice. Yeah, and when we first went to the cadet org, Hubbard was still alive. So anyone who says like, "Oh, the conditions changed after Hubbard died," no, that's not true. It was like being a cadet was always like that. It was always really bad conditions and we were considered to be like a nuisance and we just needed to be groomed to become future Sea Org members. Yeah, so it was one of those things where, and, and, and a former Sea Org member, of a friend of mine named John Peeler, he was the MAA at Goal Base Chief DBTSer on Perimeter Council. Now, he's, he made a brilliant observation, Scientology is designed to get the maximum amount of production out of people for the minimum amount of money. Yes, and they so would they put us to work. Like we would do de-weeding and cleaning the house and we'd have to go to St. Hill. Like, you know, when Battlefield Earth came out, it was the cadets that went in and stuffed all of the promotion. So this is part of Scientology's concept of exchange. If you want to eat, you have to work. Yeah, or yeah, we were just but, tools. But it's not even adequate exchange because Scientology won't even give you toilet paper or toothbrushes. No. Or no. earning the basic things. It's just the bare minimum subsistence living. So when you go when you go into the into the Sea Org at fourteen, are there? Do you eat better? Is there like do you brush your teeth? Is it a little bit better going into the Sea Org? When I went in the Sea Org, uh, when I was on the EPF, I remember getting my first paycheck, which was $15. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm rich. So, yeah, like I got my own toothbrush and I had shampoo and conditioner and, you know, the basic necessities. But the food at Flag when I first got there was disgusting. Well, what was the – I mean, what did they serve you typically? Uh, it was – I remember a lot of beans and rice. And, um, like, I remember one time there was, like, a cockroach cooked into my food. Oh. Mm, yeah. Oh. It, no, it was disgusting. Um, when I went into CMO, I would actually go to the um, the canteen and I would get noodles for lunch every day. Oh, like Top Ramen? Yeah, yeah. The, those cups of noodles that cost, like, yeah. $1. Yeah. Yeah, because that's better than what they were serving. Yeah, but then when the in execs came to flag... That was great because I got to eat like the leftovers of what they ate. Well, what I'm just curious because I like these little snippets from real life. What kind of how, how would the execs eat? Were their food much better? Yes, like the they when I in '93, like when they were all there, it was always food from the hibiscus. Mm. So and since I was on the service line, like I'd be able to order food from the hibiscus. So I remember there was like asparagus with uh, hollandaise sauce and like really good food. You know, it's it's interesting when you got your first fifteen dollar paycheck at Flag. Was that the first money you'd ever had in your life that you were was actually your own money? Yeah. Well, in the cadet org, um, there was a group of us that became really rebellious. So we would actually get these cups, like foam cups, and we would go to St. Hill and we would like beg public for money and pretend that we were like, we would have some like bullshit story of like we were doing a fundraiser or something. So we were getting like some coins. So that's the first time I made money when we did that. But then that got reported and we got pulled into security and we had to do conditions and you know, the usual screaming. Were we using the money to buy food or yes, shampoo? Yes, we would use the money to buy food. Oh, that's horrible. Not shampoo, forget it. Just food, yeah, that's that would take priority. So when the in execs would eat, you would, you would eat their leftovers? Yeah, and then when I was at Flag, like I would, like, there was, um, when I was at the Hacienda, there was always, they had like fridges full of food, so I would just eat at the Hacienda, food out of the fridge. Well, that would make sense eat yeah. when you can. From the flag land base, you were, as we talked about last time, you were sent off to the ship. Yeah, I was sent to the ship when I was um, 18. 
You know, going going back to the ship, uh, we talked about last time, but I want to go into some more levels of detail. You had a particularly horrible experience on the ship of being molested. Yes. What what, what happened? This Actually, was... I had it at flag first. Oh, what happened when there? I was 15. Okay, so, like, I was a steward, so I would, at that point, I had to, like, like stand in the kitchen all day in case COB wanted something. And, like, um, doing admin stuff. And me and him would go there early in the morning because he would have to set up the office and I would have to clean all the offices. And he, for three months straight, because I didn't have the guts to report him, he would come in there and he would, and I hate talking about this stuff because it's so degrading, but he would, like, lift me up and rub himself against me. So grind, grind his crotch into you. Yes. And um, then he did it to another girl called, and she wrote a K.R. on him. So I was like, oh, she had the guts to do it. So I did as well. And nothing happened to him. Nothing. It's always like you pulled it in and you must have 2D flowed him or like you did something wrong. And that's why it happened to you. You know, see, this is part of what, what, what someone describes as the rape culture of Scientology. Yeah. That the idea that if a woman is, or a teenager, young girl is molested, they pulled it in. Yes, it was my and fault. In, in, yeah, in Scientology thinking, could you explain what you pulled it in means, what Hubbard taught about that? So R. Ron Hubbard says that anything that happens to you that's bad, it's your fault. You did something. You did something bad, and it's your motivator. Like, you, that's what it's called. It's a motivator. You did something bad, so this is now happening to you. So it's all your fault that you were molested. Yes, but it's different rules for different folks. Like, if you're, like, was liked by COB, so, you know, he got away with it, and afterwards... Um, there was a girl that wanted to, after I had reported to him and nothing happened, there was a girl that wanted to date him called, and I was at the Hacienda cleaning and he came in there and he's like, oh, you know, he wants to date me. And I was like, well, good. And he's like, I haven't said yes. Do you know why? You know why? And I'm like, no. And then he, he's like, oh, cause I want to be with you. And he like threw me on the couch and I was super skinny and I had no defense, and he lay on top of me on the couch, and he was, like, staying on top of me and holding me down and rubbing himself against me until this guy walked in, and then he got off me. And I was too scared to report it because I knew that it would somehow be my fault. So I just, I never reported it. Yeah, and, th and that's a common thing I I've heard from women who have been in the CR, you know, when they were, were teenagers, they were afraid to report their abusers because they would be punished. Yeah. Yeah. And that shows the powerlessness of those who have been abused. But now you have power and you can speak out. Yeah. But it's still like to this day, because you have to realize that the Scientology seal culture was ingrained in me for 32 years of my life. So to this day, I still, like, it still creeps in. Like I'm still really it's hard for me to talk about and I still go like, well, you know, maybe the way I dress is too revealing or, you know, what did I do for him to think that I was interested or whatever, you know, it still is at the back of my mind. Well, you didn't do anything. It, it, sexual predators are sexual predators. Yeah. And, and one of their tac tactics is to make you think it's your fault. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was part of, part of healing from an abusive cult. You work on those issues. There's another incident or episode where okay. you were molested. Yeah, that was on the free winds, and it was in um, 1998, and it was actually right after I had gotten married. So I married this guy called Roberto, and then after I married him, he left. He was, like, never on a ship. He was gone, and told me, asked me to come into the MLO office, the medical officer's office, and said that he wanted me to do something to help him with his back, because his back was... So I was like, okay, so I went with him, and he closed the door, and he's like, let me show you, and he... And I wore a skirt, because I was a waitress at the time, so he, like, picked me up and pulled up my skirt and rubbed himself against me, like, but worse, because there was, like, 
not much between us. And then um, I was like, uh, the thing with me is that when that happens, I just f- completely freeze. Like I don't, I can't fight it off. I just, it's like I turn into an ice cube. Like I just freeze. So that's, well, yeah, there's cer- there's certain some people get paralyzed by the horror of it. I get yes, that's what happens to me. I'm just paralyzed and I like I can't fight it off. So I just sit there and let it happen basically. So yeah, so then when he was done, he put me down and then I felt terrible and I knew that I was going to be in trouble because I know how it works. And I called um Roberto on the phone like about a week later and I told him what happened so he's like well you should write a KR like write it up so I did and again nothing happened to him at all and then I got put on the meter for pulling it in you get put on the e-meter as a sec check it wasn't a sec check it was an ethics interview I'm sorry an ethics interview to find out what what you did to cause this yes and then i have to write my over some withholds of like being interesting in front of guys and you know like that was the culture like one time when i was on a ship i got like a dress um that was kind of like a, a purple dress like similar to that white marilyn monroe dress that she wore you know like yes. that famous picture yes. and since i have like like I have, sorry, but since I have boobs, so I wore it to an event and afterwards the COCMO, you know, pulled me aside and I got sent to the MAA's office and apparently the RTC rep and the COCMO were saying that me and this other girl, our dresses were too revealing and I got put on the meter and to find out like what my intentions were and I had to sell the dress to somebody that had no boobs. So if you get molested, you pulled it in. Yeah, like that's the culture. It's like, what did you do? Like, you know. But on the other hand, if you're attractive, that's also a crime. Yeah. You, so you can't win. No, you can't win. Like one time, I got my hair done, and it was like really nice. And uh, and the CSM was like, "What are you trying to do? Be a model or something?" So I was like, "Oh, I have to go." Like, like my sisters had to work with me on that. Like. You know, I feel like I feel bad if I'm like, you know, if I dress myself up too much. Like, well, this is all arbitrary. It's it's whatever the whim or caprice of an executive. Yeah. Because Scientology has a million ways to invalidate you. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're if you, they can invalidate you for being too interesting, for being counter intention, for being off purpose, for having face crimes. Maybe Mark Hadley shared it that. David Miscavige would punish people for having face crimes. Yeah. Are you familiar with? Yeah. Now what in Scientology? What is a face crime? I think that's like a um, a David Miscavige thing. But the I mean, mm. I had one incident when I was about to go to the RPF and I was like mopping a floor because I was in the galley, just cleaning pots and pans and cleaning the galley at the end of the day, and the COCMO came to me. And she's like, you know, um, I just saw the look on your face and it was case on post. So (laughs) if you have a look like that, when you go to the RPF, you're going to be sent to the RPF's RPF. And I was like, okay, like I'm obviously completely devastated and my life has been turned upside down. So what do you want me to do? Smile? Leska, this is so insane. You know, you get you get sexually molested. You have to shove it down inside you. It's your fault. Yeah. You you pulled it in. Mm-hmm. You you have a look on your face that doesn't please someone. That's a criminal act as well. Yeah. You get an ethics interview for being sexually molested. You're you're undernourished as a child. I mean, this this is like. What leads you to finally get the hell out of the Church of Scientology? What's your like? My breaking point? When, yeah, when did you break? Okay, so um, this is what I think that has to happen for any Sea Org member that is like, you know, because you, when you're in the Sea Org, you have to understand that you have been brainwashed into believing that you are the only people in the world that can save this planet, that can make it a better place, that can um, 
prevent us from having an eternity of hell. So you kind of adjust to being abused because it's all for the greater good, so it's okay. But mm -hmm. I think what happens is it has to be so bad that you go, I don't care about saving the planet anymore. Like, I don't care. I just want to get the hell out. So that's what happened to me. Yeah, it's very much self-survival, mm -hmm. self-preservation. You go through an extreme amount of adversity, yeah. pain, the hell that is Scientology, but yet you emerge and now now you're happily married and you're a mother. Yeah, and I had to go through that hell. I had to go through the engine room, the RPF, and then more threats to wake up and to be like, it's not worth it. Like, I don't want to live like this anymore. It's just, I'd rather just go live my life and be like excommunicated than have to deal with this. Sure, and I think unless people were born into it and didn't know any better, they couldn't really understand. Yes, and I was... Because it's, 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 it's all you knew. Yes, and I was born into it, and I was not only born into Scientology, I was... I went to the Sea Org when I was six. Well, Valeski, you're very brave for telling your story. Uh, and, and for people who, who are listening, this is what a, a cult does, mm. especially when, when, you, when you're born into it and you don't know any better. Yeah. You made it out and you're, you're sharing your story with people. Because I've got to tell you, so many people listen to the show and someone is still in the church under the radar listing. I can guarantee you that. I, 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 I know of two people that are, that actually contacted me after I did the show. So yeah, the last show. And, huh? and for those who are in the church and want to leave, leave, leave the church, be self-determined. Yeah. Because this kind of, this kind of nightmare life doesn't do anyone any good. It's a lot of us working you, other people to say this inhumanity has to stop the system of Scientology has to stop killing people harming people yeah you know ru ru ruining families and marriages so so I thank you very much for for being with us today and sharing some very painful real life things you're welcome yeah one thing the cadet org made me into in the sea org is um, a fighter for what I think is right so I can thank them for that. Well, that's an important thing to have in life is to fight for what you believe is, is right and to, and to expose the hell that is the Church of Scientology. Mm -hmm. So, Leska Paris, thank you for being on Surviving Scientology Radio. We look forward to having you on again to get some more some more details. Okay, thank you. I, I'm just so glad you went through what you did and you made it through because some people don't. They succumb to it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're one of the one of the heroes who made it through. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. As always, we'll be in very good touch and thank you for listening.